Hello, I'm Barry Daniel and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated ethical life, avoiding dogma or any absolute appeal to authority. Our guest today is the British journalist and human rights campaigner Peter Tatchell, who is perhaps most well known for his work with LBGT social movements and advocacy. He's here to talk to us today about homophobia, its history, causes and what can be done about it. Uh, well, uh, hello Peter, welcome to the Middle Way Society podcast. Very glad to join you. Okay, well could you perhaps begin Peter, by telling us something of your background. Well, this year, 2017, I'm celebrating my 50 years of LGBT and human rights activism. Wow. I guess I'm best known for LGBT rights, but I do a wide range of other human rights issues, both in Britain and around the world, uh, very notably uh, for free speech and in support of democracy and human rights movements in other countries, such as Russia. Pakistan, Uganda, and so on. Okay, well, let's just dive straight in then, Peter. So what, what is homophobia, and, and roughly when was the term defined? Well, the term was invented by George Weinberg in the 1970s, and the original definition was an irrational fear of homosexuality and homosexual people. Uh, but since then, it's come to have a broader meaning, um, including the notion of prejudice and discrimination. So homophobia will often be used to uh, describe um, someone who uh, opposes LGBT equal rights or someone who engages in discrimination against LGBT people. I actually prefer the term heterosexism because I think it's more accurate and more uh, more direct. Um, it's the idea of heterosexual supremacism, that heterosexuality is superior, and from that flows prejudice and discrimination. But that term, unfortunately, has fallen out of favour, and homophobia has won the day. Yeah, um, it's the first time I've heard that term, actually, but I can I definitely understand why you value that. But I imagine also homophobia when it first came into sort of the public sphere that it was helpful to the LGBT community in some way because it for the first time perhaps it described that sort of attitude as a problem as a as almost a, a condition that something something that needed to be um, resolved in some way. Well George Weinberg definitely saw homophobia as a mental state or even a psychological condition uh, which was an embodiment of a set of prejudices and ideas about homosexuality, which he saw as not being healthy and not being uh, consistent with a well-adjusted person. Yeah. Um, so he came at very much from a psychological and psychiatric viewpoint. And I can understand why he took that view, because up until that time, or certainly only a short period before, the psychological and psychiatric professions took a very negative, even hostile view towards LGBT people. Yeah. They saw homosexuality as a problem, as a disorder, as a malfunction. Yeah. Um, so he tried to turn the tables by saying that the the real dysfunction was not homosexuality per se, but the homophobia that drove LGBT people to psychological and physical ill health. Yeah, so would you say it was a turning point? Uh, it definitely was, because it established a new benchmark, not just a new word, but a new benchmark in terms of thinking about anti-LGBT prejudice. I don't know if you saw, there was, a, there was an article in The Guardian today of some statistics about sexuality, and in the UK, I think 2.2 or 2.3 percent of the population are now defining themselves of, as LBGT. But what was interesting in the States, it's, it's about 4 percent. And my understanding, you see that figure considerably higher. Does the fact that it's only 2.3 percent in the UK uh, suggest that people find it more difficult to be open about their, their sexual orientation in the UK than the U US, perhaps? Well, I think it all depends on how the question is asked. 
right. um, and who's asking us. Um, there have been many different surveys that have come out with wildly different uh, answers. So, for example, um, the Observer poll in recent years has shown that over 20 percent of young people aged 16 to 24 have had a same sex experience. So people may have a same sex experience on a quite considerable social scale, but may not necessarily define themselves as L, G, B or T. So there's often a disjunction between behavior and identity. And certainly, you know, um, there's been another survey which found that um, I think it was this year or late 2016, which found that of young people in the age bracket, 16 to 24 in the UK, 49 percent said they would not describe themselves as 100 percent straight. Does this also maybe suggest that that human sexuality in general is just a lot more complex than these black and white sort of denominations? You're either gay or you're straight. That we're all, many of us are on a spectrum. Well, that's exactly what Kinsey um, suggested in the 1940s. Yeah, he refuted the idea of a binary division between gay and straight um, and suggested that most of us are on a continuum of somewhere between 100 percent heterosexuality and 100 percent homosexuality. And I think recognizing that we all or most of us do combine elements of gay and straight is a good thing. And it enables young people to feel more comfortable about exploring both sides of their sexuality, sure. whether they are predominantly straight or predominantly gay. Yeah. And, you know, bisexuality has always been with us. And, um, you know, we know that in restrictive circumstances where um, men and women don't have the opportunities to uh, mix with the opposite sex and to have sexual relations, there tend to be much higher incidences of same-sex relations. So we see that in, or have traditionally seen that in the military, in prisons, in um single sex boarding schools, but also in countries uh, where there are strong taboos against men and women having sex before marriage. Often in those societies, men will have sex with men and women with women as a way around the restrictions on opposite sex um, interaction. Sure, yeah. Well, let's just get back to the, the theme of the aversion to homosexuality. So let's move on to uh, religion now. now. Now, what seems to be the most common religious objection to homosexuality is based on the, on an appeal to natural law. Now, now, this claims either that God designed men and women to have purely heterosexual relationships, or that it is only natural and therefore justifiable to have sexual relationships which might potentially produce children, which homosexual relationships, barring the application of recent advances in stem cell technology, cannot. So where's that come from, and how can it be countered? Well, first of all, that's all complete nonsense. Um, homosexuality has existed in every society throughout history, even in those societies that have tried to persecute and eradicate it, um, such as Iran today or the Nazis in the 1930s and 40s. So quite clearly, for a particular pattern of sexual behavior to sustain over millennia, in diverse societies and cultures all over the world, yeah. there must be something fundamental to human sexuality of which it is a part. Yeah. Uh, moreover, if we look at all known animal species that have been studied, uh, including about, that's about 500 major species that have been studied in depth, homosexuality has been found in every single one of them, ranging from, from eagles to whales to lions to yeah. you, you, you name yeah. it. <laughs> homosexuality is intrinsic to all animal species, including humans, who, of course, are an animal species. Exactly. Yeah. And I suppose also the appeal to God's design obviously involves a, an, an unjustifiable assumption. For any, even if you believe in God and the idea of design itself, it's just as plausible to argue that God designed some people to be homosexual. The argument that heterosexual relationships are more natural because they can produce children then makes infertile heterosexual relationships just as unnatural. So the whole argument seems very flawed. You're right. And of course, the reality is that many same-sex couples do have children these days. 
They don't need a heterosexual act of intercourse to produce those children. It can be done by artificial insemination by donor, either by the couple themselves. They don't need a doctor. They can just do it themselves through, through donated sperm. Um, so even if there was never again a single act of heterosexual intercourse anywhere in the world, <laughs> we could reproduce the human species quite easily. And if you talk about design, then quite clearly, um, God designed uh, men to have anal intercourse because the prostate gland, uh, which is adjacent to the anal wall, is a sex gland that produces quasi-orgasmic feelings, which is why um, so many, not all, but so many uh, men who have sex with men enjoy being the penetrated partner because the act of penetration, when it stimulates the prostate gland, does cause orgasmic type sensations. So if you want to talk about, you know, the, the issues of design or effect, uh, there's no doubt that anal sex is of incredible pleasure and uh, when it's done properly, of course. And, you know, you know, I respect people who have a religious faith, but not if they're going to use that faith to discriminate or act in a way that's prejudiced towards others. Sure, yeah. And, and doesn't, in any case, our estimation of what is natural, in quotes, in human relationship seem to be so much subject to our culture and upbringing that it seems to often just mean merely socially acceptable? Well, that's right. In, in, in some cultures, uh, currently and historically, it's been pretty much normal and accepted that uh, particularly young boys will have sexual relations with other young boys and that's just seen as part of the growing up process. Yeah. And Fordham Beach, the anthropologists produced or published a study, an anthropological study in the 1960s called Patterns of Sexual Behavior, in which they looked at, I think, 76 uh, pre-capitalist tribal societies in, all around the world. And they found that in two thirds of those societies, homosexuality was either tolerated or even accepted. So quite clearly, there was a cultural dimension. And um, Masters and Johnson, Margaret Mead, many others have studied different cultures and seen very clearly that uh, not all cultures take our view on human sexuality, including the fact that many of those cultures are open to the fact that some people will be attracted and have sexual and emotional contact with other people of the same gender. So homophobia obviously seems very much a, a cultural thing, but, but what about the psychological causes? To what degree, for example, do you think anxiety and denial, etc., play a part? Well, undoubtedly, um, you know, the evidence is that uh, human sexuality, both heterosexuality and homosexuality, is predominantly caused by a combination of genetic inheritance and hormonal influences in the womb. Those are the two prime causes. But obviously, there are other factors unknown because human sexuality is very poorly understood or not or fully understood. Um, and the big issue is, of course, uh, in terms of acceptance. Now, you know, what what is uh, clear is that uh, the extent to which people accept their sexual orientation or gender identity is very much contingent on social factors, on cultural values and norms on expectations among peers around. So in more liberal, enlightened societies, um, LGBT people will find it much easier to come to terms with their sexuality and accept it and then act upon it. In highly repressed, particularly religious dominated societies, um, they will find it much more difficult and they'll often repress their sexual orientation. They won't accept it. They will be, uh, you know, embroiled in feelings of self-loathing and hate and may even be psychologically disturbed and depressed as a result of those social prescriptions. Um, and a degree of homophobia can be explained by social pressures and norms. So if you're living in a society like I grew up in the 1950s and 60s, where homophobia was the norm, um, people were homophobic because that was the norm. Yeah. Um, and so people were conforming to an expectation 
to be homophobic. Um, there's also a factor which probably does apply to some considerable degree that many people who are homophobic are insecure about their own sexuality right. and that homophobia is a manifestation of their own internal fears and a projection onto others of their own self-hatred. So this was adduced, well, it was theorized by Sigmund Freud in his psychoanalysis, you know, the ideas of projection and displacement, you, you, you project and displace onto others the fears you have about yourself. Yeah. Um, but, but it was tested out empirically in the 1990s by Professor Henry Adams at the University of Georgia in the United States. Um, he wanted to test out the theory that homophobia was a displaced form of unacceptable or non-accepting or a denial of homosexuality. So he interviewed a cross section of men um, and began by asking their attitudes towards um, homosexuality. And uh, in anyone who expressed, um, you know, unclear views was discarded. And he was left with two groups of people, one of which was 100 percent straight um, but pro-gay, and the other group that was 100% straight but anti-gay. And then he invited them to the university, put them in a video suite, wired them up to a plethysmograph, which is a small elasticated device which goes around the penis and is linked to a computer, and registered any any movement or enlargement in the penis consistent with sexual arousal. Yeah. And then he showed those men. Uh, first of all, heterosexual porn videos and then gay porn videos. And he analyzed the results. And he found that among the group of men who said they were 100% straight, but were very relaxed about gay people, a small number got aroused by the gay porn videos, but they had very strong arousal watching the straight porn videos. In contrast, the group of men who said they were 100% straight, but were very anti-gay, um, Looking at the heterosexual porn videos, they were marginally heterosexually dysfunctional. Their erections were not as frequent and as strong. But when looking at the gay porn videos, 80 percent were sexually aroused. So he concluded that in that sample, which he believed was broadly representative of men, that um, homosexuality and homophobia were very much linked, that homophobia was a displaced form of homosexuality, homosexuality that the subjects could not themselves accept and in many cases didn't even recognize. Yeah, yeah. But the computer didn't lie. The computer showed facts, yeah. So there was a lot of repression going on there, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, let, let's look now in a bit more detail that the damage this uh, prejudice causes. I've heard that in the LGBT community, suicide, for example, is significantly higher than, you know, in the... Um, in, than in the wider public and then things like drug and alcohol abuse homelessness bullying am i right in saying that the most common form of hate crime is lbgt uh, prejudice um it depends on the survey but okay. it's, it's very high up there it's high, up, up with racism or uh, other forms of prejudice yeah and you know, certainly in school playgrounds LGBT bullying or bullying against LGBT kids is, you know, reportedly the most common and most frequent. And then arguably it's not just the people on the receiving end it damages, but the the perpetrators too, in the, in the sense that, you know, it's it's really narrowing the, 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 the possibilities in their own lives. Well, absolutely. You know, those people who perpetrate homophobia um, will be living in a society where they will be interacting with LGBT people as family members, neighbours work colleagues and so on and if they harbor prejudice then quite clearly those relationships will be strained and that they won't be happy conducive relationships to you know living in a harmonious society yeah, yeah. Um, homophobia also does impact straight people in sometimes very dramatic ways i'm thinking back to the early 1990s in a case that i was involved in of a young man in his early 20s 
uh, he went to uh, see his girlfriend to the tube station at Clapham Common. They'd been out for an evening meal. She was going home. So he walked her to the station and said goodbye. And then he walked back across Clapham Common. And a gang of youths mistook him for a gay man. And they beat him to death. Oh. Not only beat him to death, but kicked him when he was on the ground so hard that he was effectively decapitated. Um, and he was straight. Yeah, yeah. So it just shows that the impact of homophobia isn't just on LGBT people, although that is a particularly extreme example. I can think of many other instances where straight, some straight friends of mine have been abused or threatened in the street because some bigot thought they were gay or lesbian. Yeah. Okay, well, so what can we do about it, Peter? Well, obviously, there have been huge positive changes. So, so uh, back in the 1980s, the British Social Attitude Survey in the late 80s asked the public about their attitudes towards homosexuality. And in the late 1980s, two thirds said they believed that homosexuality was mostly or always wrong. In the most recent survey a couple of years ago, that figure has dropped to about one fifth. So from two thirds to one fifth, a big fall. Yeah. But still, it's quite shocking that one fifth, one in five people in Britain still believe that homosexuality is mostly always wrong. Um, whether those people would actively discriminate or engage in hate crime, I mean, some might, but I doubt that many would. I think we have fundamentally changed public perceptions and attitudes, and that has been both to the fact of LGBT people coming out to family, friends and neighbours and showing we're not monsters. Um, that's that's the most single most important way to break down prejudice. It's been shown that a person, a straight person who knows a gay person will be much less likely to be prejudiced and much more likely to support gay equality. So mm-hmm. coming out has been a key thing, plus the advent of gay characters in soaps, films, yeah. books, plays, that's also helped normalise uh, same-sex relations. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that all those factors together have produced those important changes. But having said that, even today, the most recent survey found that 45% of LGBT pupils in schools have faced homophobic bullying of some sort, uh, or homophobic, biphobic, or transphobic bullying of some sort, uh, ranging from insults and threats to actual physical violence. That's 45% in 2017. Wow. Now, my view is that for the future, the best way to try and reduce not just homophobia, but racism, misogyny, prejudice against disabled people or immigrants and refugees. The best way to do that is to make sure that we have equality and diversity lessons in our schools from primary level onwards, uh, continuously throughout our pupils' life, not just once a year, but probably at least once a month, um, to challenge all forms of prejudice. And my reasoning for that is that we know that no child is born prejudiced. No child comes out of the womb with bigoted ideas. That is learned behavior. Learn from parents or other family members, from um, TV or tabloid newspapers, uh, from other kids at school. And we know from where these education programs have been tried that they can dramatically reduce prejudice, bullying at school, and subsequent hate crime. So that's my big push to the government. They've got to introduce equality and diversity lessons across the board, tackle all forms of prejudice. And if that's done, not only will homophobia decline in current and indeed future generations, but uh, it will also reduce other forms of prejudice as well. If we understand prejudice as basically an absolute view of things in the sense that, you know, we think we have the the full picture about a thing or a person before without needing to consult our, our experience, you know, so we get into these fixed positions. Do you think also 
uh, sort of emotional education would help at that, you know, at that, especially at that primary level, so, you know, doing things like mindfulness. So where kids sit with their experience and learn to respond to it rather than just react to it and, and, and you know, keep a more open mind and openness to possibilities. And maybe combining that also with things like critical thinking, where you um, learn to interrogate your beliefs, perhaps in a more intellectual way. But, you know, there, there is an argument for starting early with that, too. And then that combined with these diversity lessons, these kids will have a better chance to actually unpack, you know, sometimes those fairly complex ideas as well. Oh, no, absolutely. And, and that, that would be part of the equality and diversity lessons that would include elements of, of critical thinking and um, the importance of analysis, yeah. you know, evidence based thinking and those kind of things. Great. OK, so, you know, if there are people out there who, who do recognize perhaps later in life that they have homophobic tendencies, which they're actually uncomfortable with and would like to do something about it. What would you recommend? Well, I can remember in 1972, I interrupted a lecture by a man who was then probably the world's most famous psychologist, Professor Hans Eysenck, at St. Thomas's Hospital in London. He was justifying the use of electric shock and nausea-inducing aversion therapy to cure homosexuality. Oh. <laughs> uh, I challenged him and was um, actually physically assaulted by people in the audience for daring to challenge this great man. Wow. Um, but one of his co-speakers was Professor Isaac Marx, or actually I think then he was just Dr. Isaac Marx um, from the Morsley Hospital. And he too was giving justification for version therapy. Some years ago, Dr. Marx was approached, now Professor Marx, a, a highly esteemed uh, psychiatrist, and he has now taken a completely different view. You know, in his view, if anybody came to him, he would try to seek to get them to understand and accept their own homosexuality, not fight it. And indeed, if anybody came to him with, you know, troubling homophobic feelings and prejudices, he would also try to tackle that. So quite clearly, I think that is the way to go. I think we need to look at homophobia, like racism and other forms of prejudice, as um, a view or a viewpoint that is often uh, based on views that are not supported by evidence. So irrational, uh, non-factual fears and claims about homosexuality and there was quite clearly a, a case, a strong case for that to be challenged and, you know, in a, in a, in a gentle you know, and supportive way by psychiatrists and psychologists. Now, that makes sense. Yeah. OK. Um, what is your understanding of the middle way, uh, Peter, if any, in, in relation to what we've been talking about today? Well, do you want to explain what the middle way is? I suppose the middle way is the idea that if you in, avoid fixed or absolute uh, beliefs about things that throws you back onto the messy world of experience but, but arguably in that messy uh, uncertain world of experience we can uh, perhaps get to grips more adequately with the experience we encounter whatever they are in one sense it's a strategy of avoidance but the, on the other side is the positive side is the idea of integration so on the uh, integration is is actually taking at perhaps perhaps what's useful from those those extremes and reconciling them. So that in a in a nutshell, that's what the middle way is. I think there are some problems with that because if it's about exploring one's own experience, then if you have a prejudiced and bigoted experience, and you're around people who have similar experiences, you're actually going to get your views reinforced, not challenged. So what you're saying is dependent on people from very different backgrounds coming together. And even then, of course, there's no guarantee that um, someone with a more liberal, enlightened, tolerant view will necessarily hold sway against someone who has a preconceived bigotry. And I, I, say, I say that because I have engaged in the past with people from far right and racist backgrounds yeah. and found it very difficult to dissuade or challenge them because even though I and others have been able to give them 
counter experiences and counter information and even uh, counter evidence, uh, they have not been swayed. Sure. Now, that doesn't mean to say we shouldn't try. No, no, no harm in trying. Um, but that, that's, that's one problem. The second problem is um, the middle way can often be a fudge. That, that would be my anxiety. The middle way can end up, you know, well, saying, well, you know, we're not in favor of gay rights. We're not against gay rights. But, you know, we're somewhere in the middle. Do you get my drift? OK, well, I, I just to answer those two things, I think just the very notion of prejudice from a middle way perspective is a fixed position because prejudice in and of itself is basically a belief that that is not really open to experience you think pretty much you have the whole picture about that group of people or that ideology or whatever so we definitely see prejudice as you know something that is fixed and not really open to alternatives so that that's in response to your first thing and the other thing about being a fudge um, the middle way sometimes uh, compromise is the best solution but the middle way is is not is not about, about fudging. It's about basically in any given situation, there's a point of balance, and that's the middle way. So often a certain certain thing, for example, like climate change, uh, you know, could could be for some people viewed quite radical. Or or the middle way in terms of LGBT rights, the position on that certainly from our perspective, we would have held this same position arguably 40 years ago even when it would have, you know, would have been seen as not just cohering with, with the, what was socially acceptable for the day, basically. I mean, just to give you an example, I mean, you could say that the Wolfenden Report and the subsequent 1967 Sexual Offences Act were a product of the middle way, in the sense it was a compromise between LGBT people's just claim for equality and... Uh, the hard right homophobes who wanted to keep criminalization. Yeah. And so we ended up with Wolfenden making a set of very flawed, unequal proposals and those ending up in law, uh, which actually continued and actually exacerbated the criminalization of gay and bisexual men after 1967. So as a result of that flawed legislation, uh, the number of gay and bisexual men convicted uh, for consenting adult same-sex behaviour, increased by over 400% in the years after 1967, and at least 15,000 gay and bisexual men were convicted and got criminal convictions, criminal records, um, in the years after 67, until the law was finally changed, until there was full decriminalisation in 2003. Yeah, well, that, that, that's clearly a very flawed um, judgment. To me, that that is a good example of a fudge and to me that's not the middle way the middle way tries to take into account as best as possible as wide a range of conditions as possible in any given situation including our own flawed nature so there's the constant attempt with that for, uh, with the middle way and that that example you gave seems a, a very quite a poor example of that so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't personally define that as the middle way but anyway uh, just final two questions. Uh, if people wanted to find out more about your work, Peter, how would they go about it? Uh, you can go to my foundation's website, which is www.petertatchellfoundation.org. Um, in the top right hand corner, you'll see a button which says join us. You can click on there to receive our regular email bulletins. They're all free. It's free to subscribe. There's no charge. Um, but if you think the work we do is of some value and uh, support the work we do, you are welcome to also click the donate button, which uh, means you could sign up to maybe give us a, you know, two or three or five pounds a month to help continue our work. And please do follow me on Twitter and on Facebook. You know, Twitter is probably, I probably do about 10 or 12 tweets a day at least on a whole range of issues. Um, you know, defending racial and religious minorities in Britain and around the world, um, supporting uh, democracy struggles and political prisoners in countries like Saudi Arabia. There's a whole vast uh, deluge of, of, of campaigns and causes that I, that I work on. And I think uh, most people will find a lot of them are below the radar. They're often causes and issues and concerns that do not get much into the national media and a little known and supported. So 
become part of our human rights community by joining us. Brilliant. And my last question, uh, you you often put yourself in in very, very challenging situations and very admirably so. I just, w- just wondered where you get your courage from, Peter. Well, I'm just doing what I believe to be right. Uh, I follow my conscience. Of course, I could be totally wrong, but I'm doing what I believe to be right. And uh, my devout evangelical parents, uh, that's one thing they taught me. Uh, they taught me to not follow the mob, not go along with what everybody else is doing or saying. Think for yourself and do what you believe to be right. And, you know, I have taken a lot of risks. Um, I think I've been arrested over 200 times. I've been physically violently assaulted over 300 times, including uh, 50 bricks and bottles through my flat windows, three arson attempts, a bullet through the front door. Wow. Nearly, all the, nearly all the teeth in my mouth have been smashed where I've been beaten up by members of the National Front, the BNP, uh, EDL supporters, um, far-right Islamists, uh, neo-Nazis in Moscow and several other places. Um, so, yeah, I, I have paid a price, but nothing by comparison to what human rights defenders in many other countries face. So if I was in Iran today or... Uh, Russia or many, many other countries, I'd probably be in prison, possibly tortured or maybe even killed. So by comparison to those people, I think I'm lucky and I've, the price I've paid has been very small. So they are my inspiration. They, they, those are the people that keep me going. And I think it's, it's really important that, you know, not everyone has to do what I do, but it's really important that everyone does something yeah. because Bad things happen because good people look the other way. And um, for me, uh, to be good is to take a stand. Yeah. Well, I think it's absolutely fantastic the work you've done over the years, Peter. And I'm I'm a great admirer. And it's been a, a real pleasure talking to you today. Thank you very much for giving up your time. Thank you. And can I leave my final message, uh, my motto, which is don't accept the world as it is. Dream of what the world could be and then help make it happen. You can find out more about Middleway Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org.